Hello, this is Dr. Halisa Elwin. Welcome back to our study in Workbook 2 of the Creation Gospel series. We are studying the seven abominations of the wicked lamp. We worked our way through that, and now we're looking at the seven seals of Revelation. And at this point, we have dropped ourselves down into the sixth seal, and we're trying to uncover some of the meanings behind what John is seeing with the opening of the sixth seal. And in the last program, we established the encampments of the 12 tribes and then the encampment of those four divisions, how they were arranged according to uh, the four winds and how each division of those tribes was to face into one of those four winds as represented by the symbols on their degelim or their banners. Uh, Judah facing east with the lion and his division. Dan, he's facing north with the eagle and his division. Ephraim with the, the children of Rachel, they're facing west with the emblem of the ox um, on their degel. And then to the south, you have Reuven with his division, uh, the symbol of a man. And these symbols uh, of the four divisional banners, they reflect the sides or the faces of the divine chariot that Ezekiel saw and how they're full of eyes, which means they're very sensitive to the spirit. When the spirit says to do something, they do it immediately. They do it like lightning, in fact. Uh, the, the word that Ezekiel uses for the... Uh, the way that the chariot moved, uh, the, the particular type of fire associated with it was cheshmal in Hebrew. And it's not the same as esh. Esh is fire, but cheshmal, it's a different kind of fire. In fact, the modern Hebrew word for electricity is cheshmal, and an electrician is uh, uh, So. You can see that it's a very fast fire that it's associated with. And, and with the encampments of the Israelites, again, their response, as we read in a commentary by Rashi in the last program, their response uh, was to be according to the spirit to which they were assigned. Their, the side they were assigned to had to do with where that spirit was facing because that spirit, of course, uh, was to provide structure, direction, discipline, and most of all, blessing in the, the direction that that particular division placed. As long as Israel was obeying the Torah, they were true to their covenant, they were hearing, they were listening to the Holy One, then they were part of this divine machine where he would release down from the cloud of glory he would release the blessing to them. It would uh, link up there with their obedience, with their relationship to the Holy One, and uh, it would go back up into the cloud again, and then it would start dropping blessing. It would start dropping rains over the whole earth according to what was needed so that the winds would not be dropping um, the snow, uh, the rain, the hail, and so forth. Uh, in improper ways at improper times. Instead, each of these four winds would be able to uh, release a blessing to the corners of the earth where they were assigned. So it was um, kind of a little recreation of the Garden of Eden where man prays. He maintains that relationship with the Holy One, which is often represented by incense, um, and you'll see the incense also in the book of Revelation at, at the heavenly altar. But man maintains his relationship. He prays for rain. The rain or blessing falls, falls upon the earth. The obedience goes back up. The rain falls again. The obedience falls. And it, it's, a, it's a beautiful cycle that's represented by the encampments. Now we know there were 12 tribes in the way that they encamped. Um, you kind of move tribes in and out depending on what your purpose is in listing them because the house of Joseph can also be broken into two. It can be separated into two entities, Ephraim and Menashe. 
And you see that in the encampment of the tribes. And of course, inside, um, Levi is, he is one of the tribes, but he's also apart from the tribes. But he has his own camp there around the Mishkan. Um, there are going to be other times, like in the book of Revelation, where you might see the tribe of um, Ephraim actually called the house of Joseph. And then Menashe listed separately. There's going to be a point to that. <clears throat> but for us, for right now, uh, just understanding the encampment of those 12 and how they were to affect uh, the entire world. They were to be a light to the world. In this particular encampment, they were to be part of the blessings upon the world. One illustration of this I found uh, in, uh, it was a medieval book, actually. It was a commentary upon these encampments. And it, it had a, an odd statement that caught my, my eye at the beginning. And it says, no miracle worker is aware of his own miracle. I thought, what does that mean? And so I kept reading. I thought, well, what does this have to do with the tribes encamped around the Mishkan? And, and I found out. Um, it was kind of an extensive um, way of, of getting at this point. No miracle worker is aware of his own miracle. But it was discussing the 12 loaves that were in the holy place. Uh, they're called uh, the, the bread of faces. In Hebrew, that reflects it better than showbread. I, I'm not sure how the showbread came about as a translation, but bread of faces is very close. The, the lechem panim has to do with the face itself. In terms of how the tribes encamped, they had to face toward a certain direction and in the way that they camp because each is facing out toward one of the toward one of the four winds they're actually as they face outward they're covering the whole earth is the idea and they're using the the 12 loaves of the bread of faces to describe what's happening with these 12 tribes as they face out to the four winds and affect the whole world with blessing or through disobedience, they can allow the world to fall into chaotic weather pat patterns. They can allow, because of the chaotic weather, weather patterns, they can fall into plague, famine, these sorts of things. Uh, and so they said that the 12 loaves in the holy place represent the work of the 12 tribes. And if you'll remember, the frankincense had to be uh, placed right on top of the, the bread of faces. And you say, why? Because at the end of the week, the priests were going to eat the bread of faces. And they were going to change it out. They were going to put fresh loaves in each week. And then they would sit there in a, in a special place, and they would eat the bread of faces. But what was the function of the frankincense? Well, the, the, the point was made that um, the frankincense was not something you ate. The, the human being, the priest, he's not going to eat this frankincense that's piled on top of the bread of faces. That's purely for the enjoyment of the Holy One. Remember, it represents the prayers and these odors of good deeds. I don't know if you knew it, but when you do a good deed, when you do a, a, a mitzvah, it releases an odor. Maybe you can't smell it, but Yeshua can, because it, it talks about it in Isaiah 11, that he's not going to judge by the sight of his eyes. He's not going to judge by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness, he's going to judge for the needy. And in that sentence, there's a, it's like he's going to sniff it out. Reach, ruach, his spirit, reach, his sense of smell. Yeshua is actually going to be able to sniff out in his judgment. And this is the idea of frankincense. Uh, it, it represents the odors of righteousness that should be emanating from the 12 tribes represented by the bread of faces. Each tribe has its own face as it faces outward to the world. So <clears throat> the point here is 
Only the Holy One is benefiting from the incense. This is what pleases Him. He's not going to eat the bread. Who will eat the bread? This is going to help you connect. Remember in a previous program, we talked about the 12 baskets of bread that was left over after Yeshua had his 12 disciples pass out the bread. It multiplied. He ends up with 12 baskets. Well, in this case, we have 12 whole loaves. And so with these 12 loaves of the bread of faces, the benefit is going to be to the priests. It's going to be to human beings. Human beings eat the loaves. Human beings benefit from the, the bread. Adonai consumes or eats the frankincense. He consumes the, the good deeds. It pleases his soul. It's very pleasant to him when we obey him and want to be with him and pray and have that relationship with him. And this is where that comment, no miracle worker is aware of his own miracle, comes in. They say that Israel tended to be unaware of how important their job was on the earth. That they had become part of this divine machine, this divine weather machine, this divine blessing machine. That just as the bread of faces was maintained in the holy place with piled up with the frankincense, the odors of prayers and good deeds, they didn't always see how the frankincense connected to the physical bread itself. But it was called a reminder offering. Uh, eventually the frankincense would be burned. That's an offering to the Holy One. That's what we do for Him. Our obedience is what we do for Him. But then we realize that we have these 12 chalot, Chala is singular, chalot is plural. And it says, from here, this is where the blessing is going to come to the world. Remember, the frankincense is what we give to him. But the bread represents what he gives to the world through the 12 tribes. Because these 12 chalot didn't just correspond to the 12 tribes, they corresponded to 12 angels that were said to surround the throne of glory. Um, now we think of those 12 tribes camped in their four camps of the cloud that had descended from the throne. So as if the throne itself had descended down into the camp of Israel, and now the 12 tribes were like those 12 angels that surrounded the throne. They, they're enclosed in the clouds of glory. And therefore, what those 12 tribes are doing as it concerns their relationship to the covenant is now able to send blessing out in the four directions that they face. Three to each wind. Uh, three to each of those four banners. And... Uh, it says, also corresponding to them below were the 12 lions on Solomon's throne. And they are like these 12 loaves and the 24 tenth measures. Arouse your mind to this. Well, they're talking about these 24 tenth measures in the temple. Well, we know that in Revelation it describes 24 elders around the throne. So now you're beginning to see how what we read about as an earthly encampment really was as Moses saw in the heavenlies. He saw the throne, he saw the clouds, he saw the angels, he saw the banners. He saw everything in the heavenly place, and then he saw the physical counterpart on this earth. And if he could replicate what he saw in the heavenlies, then he could bring these two realms together where there'd be like a kiss. And they could begin to work together again like they did in the Garden of Eden. Because the Garden of Eden is where the natural realm and the spiritual realm kissed. This is where they, they embraced. And this is the realm that we want to return to. But until that day, the, the 12 tribes in those four divisions, they were supposed to be like that bread that Yeshua sent out with his 12 disciples, take this out to everybody who's sitting on the green grass. The green grass representing anybody who will absorb the word of God. 
So those, those four encampments, those four divisions, uh, they represented four spirits. Again, from the divine chariot. Each one representing one of the four living creatures of the divine chariot. From the, the spirit of Adonai. And just to refresh your memory, you say, okay, there's only four spirits. I thought there were seven. The answer is yes. It's chiastic. Uh, I've taught you a little bit about chiastic structure, and that's the most graphic illustration you can ever have. And again, it gives you a better picture, again, of the wheel within the wheel that Ezekiel is seeing. As you understand how those uh, four spirits become actually seven spirits, but see, there's still only four because of the circular nature of how they move, kind of like the way that the four winds are going to move. So the, the banners or the, the degelim, those four divisional banners, they're not just banners or flags. They're each representing a face, a wind, a direction of the spirit that that division is supposed to operate around the world. Should the tribe of Judah and his division fall down on the job, it's going to affect everything in the east. Should the, the tribes of Ephraim and, and Menashe, should they fall down in the west, it's going to affect everything happening in the west. So you've got this uh, blue banner with a lion on it that's going to be held by the tribe of Judah for his division. It's thought that the angel Gabriel or Gabriel was associated with that face or that division, that wind. In the south, you have a red flag or a red degel. It's going to be held by the tribe of Reuven with the symbol of a man. And that's thought to be um, under the, the control of the angel Michael or Michael. In the West, you have Ephraim holding the divisional degel of the bull, which is also thought to be the domain, the assignment of the angel Raphael. In the North is the tribe of Dan holding for his division uh, the symbol of the eagle. And you won't find this in scripture. It's, you might find it in places like the book of Enoch. It's thought that Uriel, that was his domain. And so tradition is associating these four angels with the four winds, and we say, well, I don't really see that, but you just read it in the book of Revelation, that there were four angels holding back four winds. Are those the specific names of the, the angels? We don't know for sure. We do know that definitely Michael's name is coming up in Revelation, that he is associated with one of these particular winds. So, you know, if they call that one right, there's a really good chance they're calling the other three right. Uh, the idea of these four winds, though, is they each have a particular nature. And the problem with having four separate winds or four separate divisions, each with its particular nature, is if they are not in unity and they're not working together, then you can have an adverse reaction. If you get four winds blowing simultaneously, you get things like tornadoes. Uh, you get hurricanes. You get rotation you don't want to get. There, there is a divine rotation of the heavenly chariot. The, the wheels of the chariot will turn divinely, and they can bring blessing on the earth, but they can also bring judgment in that rotation. Um, so th it was necessary for the tribes to function in their spiritual calling, to stay in their lane, uh, not to try to do one another's job, because this would introduce chaos into the winds. It's the Holy One Himself who has to manage how these winds blow. And, of course, He's delegated it to these four angels. And so the Israelites were working in concert with these four angels in order for the winds to blow around the earth in harmony instead of destruction. Because ultimately, the coordination of these winds comes from the throne itself, 
those orders come from the throne. We can hear the, the, the four angels being told, just be still until we've sealed the bond servants in their foreheads. So the, the ultimate order comes from the throne. But we can understand now why in the garden that obedience would have created an ideal weather situation, an ideal blessing situation. We can also understand in, in the prophets when it begins addressing the four winds, and maybe it addresses two opposite winds. For instance, um, I will say to the north wind, give them up. I will say to the south wind, don't hold back. The one who can co coordinate more than one wind. See, each angel, he's, angels are very one task oriented. Don't try to distract them because they're not that distractible. They basically have one mission and they go do that mission. So you have four different angels assigned four different directions. You can't ask the angel who's controlling the east wind to be concerned about controlling the west wind. That's not his job. He's not going to leave his lane. That's why it needs the throne to coordinate the work of these four angels and these four winds. And the throne is responding again, using these clouds of glory to perpetuate this blessing machine or this chaos machine, depending on the response of Israel to be a light to the nations and to, to walk in their covenant. So for one who can say to the north, give them up, and to the south, don't hold back, that unique quality you can tell is divine. It's coming from the throne because it's not the job of an angel to manage two winds simultaneously. The Holy One can manage four winds simultaneously. And so if he wants two winds working at exactly the same time, he calls it forth. On a normal day, you typically have one prevailing wind. If we're sailors, we know that. There's a, there's a prevailing wind. It doesn't mean the other winds aren't blowing. It just means that one prevails over the other. When we see the, these divine orders going out into the different directions in order to produce a unified result, that's how we know that the Holy One is involved in the process. So like Isaiah says in um, Isaiah 43, 6, I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, don't hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. It's a coordinated effort of north and south with no prevailing wind. That's divine. Matthew 24, 31 says, He will send forth his angels with a great trumpet blast. So again, it sounds like these four angels are going out to the four winds. They're going to sound a great trumpet blast, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Now you realize if, if you keep going out in the four directions, it eventually encompasses the whole earth. There won't be anywhere on earth that the elect cannot be gathered. Um, <clears throat> Rabbi Elazar comments on this. He says, there are four winds in the world. The east wind, the west wind, the south wind, and the north wind. The east wind, from there the light goes out to the world. The south wind, from there dew of blessing and rains of blessing go out to the world. The west wind, from there darkness goes out to the world. The north wind, from there the stores of snow, the stores of hail and cold and heat and rains go out to the world. And then he goes on about the north wind, and he says something really odd, something you don't really expect to find in this particular place. So I'll just, I'll just read it to you, and then we'll see if we can't find a place to plug it in. He says concerning the north wind that Adonai created but didn't complete it. 
He said that anyone who would say that he is God should come and complete this wind which I left alone, and all will know that he is God. What an odd statement. He left the north wind incomplete. And if somebody believes he is God, he should come and complete that wind. In other words, take authority over that wind the way that the throne does. Well, how many times in the book of Revelation is the lamb associated with the throne? At any rate, these explanations, they're from a, a central point on the earth. They're from the point of view of Israel. That's not from the point of view of Canada or Australia or Fiji or Cyprus or anywhere else. It's from the point of view of Jerusalem and Israel. And the point that he's trying to make here is that each of these winds do a different job. North and south are not only polar opposites, but their waters are different. Uh, if you look at the north wind, the type of, of moisture that you're getting from the north wind, it's different than the type of moisture you're getting from the south wind. Each has its own job, but the waters are different. In Hosea 11, 9, it says, I will not carry out my fierce anger. I will not destroy Ephraim again. Remember, Ephraim camped on the west. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They will walk after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. Indeed, he will roar, and his sons will come trembling from the west. So now that we know about the encampments, that makes a whole lot of sense. As the tribes were dispersed, uh, apparently they, they tended to go in the direction that they faced. Um, but what is the, the roar that brings them all from their different directions, especially Ephraim coming from the west? It's the roar of a lion. And Judah carried the, the banner of the lion. It was his division. He always started first. Once the ark and the cloud moved, Judah was going to take the first steps, no matter which direction they went. And so it sounds like in the dispersion, it's Judah who is going to find his placement first. He'll, he'll take those first steps of being placed in Israel, which is very consistent with what we know of history. There will come a point where Judah will begin to roar like a lion. Yeshua is described as the lion of the tribe of Judah in Scripture. So, this roar of the lion will go forth from the east. Um, and east in scripture tends to mean from the origin, from the beginning, from the original place, from the, the primeval beginning. So hearing that lion roar, not only do we have the idea that I will say to the north, give them up. I will say to the south, don't hold back. And Ephraim will hear the lion roar, and he will come trembling from the west. It doesn't sound like he's coming with a lot of arrogance. It doesn't sound like he's coming as if he already has everything nailed down. It doesn't even sound like he's coming with a lot of confidence. It sounds like he's coming very humbly when he hears that lion roar from the east. And within the text, we hear, I will not carry out my fierce anger. I will not come in wrath, which is the exact opposite of what we've been reading in the sixth seal of how he's working against the wicked. The wicked are experiencing the wrath of the lamb. 
He is angry with them, but he's saying Ephraim will come trembling from the west, but he will not be experiencing the wrath of the Lamb.